okay, my daughter's making cookies, and so she's going to keep mixing for about one to two minutes. So we will turn that noise off in just a minute. But this is going to be a fun class tonight, so we're going to let people in as they come, and we're going to talk about saving seeds. All right, Ezekiel, is everything going the way it needs to? Do I need to turn anything else on? No, I think you're about good. Um, okay. Get out of your computer. So that I, I don't want to bog down your network. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to... Does it say screen sharing ended on your side? Yes, it does. Excellent. Okay. Uh you know that hat's funny um gabe brown and joel salatin both talk about how when farmers get out of the traditional agriculture they stop getting ball caps but you've got a ball cap from a real good place to get ball caps <laughs> okay let me see about us sharing my screen here Okay, good. That's the way I wanted it. Okay, we're good. We're happy. We're ready to go. So I've got the recording on. And we're screen sharing, and it is almost time to start. Give it about one more minute. Let a couple more people get in here. So that'll be good. Okay, I'm muting myself and shutting my camera down. Okay, uh, great. We're going to get started. It's going to be exciting. We're waiting for just a second to let some more people in. I want to get started. I'm excited, but the clock says it's not time to start, so I'll be patient. It's going to be exciting. It's been a fun week. I wonder. Yeah. Okay, it's time to start. All right. So I think on our first class, I showed this slide already about companies where I like to get my seeds. I think somebody asked that question. And so I showed them this slide. So there's a lot of places to get seed if you want to order seed. These are some of my favorite places to get seed because they have specific varieties that I like. But that is not necessarily the topic tonight. Our topic tonight is about how to save our own seed from your own garden, your own crops that you're, uh, you're growing from. So I'm going to talk about one aspect of this. And then we will, uh, we'll just talk about more, like if you have more questions, we can go into more details. But tonight we're just going to talk about um, growing seeds that will do good in your own area. So that's mostly what we're going to be talking about. So it should be uh, should be super fun tonight. So if you want to ask questions tonight, just type it in the chat. And then it's been working pretty good the last few weeks to just have Ezekiel keep track of those and uh, read those to me when we get to that point. But we're going to spend, um, I don't even know how long, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes somewhere in that time frame on the subject tonight of saving our own garden seeds. And then we can open it up to garden questions and answers. And we can even talk about other things that are food related. If you have questions about uh, being prepared for uh, growing food to feed your families in hard times, anything like that, we can um, talk about all those subjects. So that will be fun. But tonight is fun. We've had a really good week around here. Uh, we've been planting things. I got my uh, whole bunch of my um, crops planted. The I got my 80 tomato plants planted that I'm growing this year, and they are in the solar greenhouse, so they're going good. And I have a bunch of extras that we're gonna put outside. I'm putting about maybe between 100 and 200 outside this year. I don't remember what my plan was. That's why, <laughs> but I know it's a lot. And then I have several others that I've potted up for uh, people to buy. If, you, if you're local and you want to come buy some tomatoes, I have some extras. 
Uh, my wife is graduating from BYU uh, with her psychology degree. So that's pretty awesome. So she's getting her bachelor's degree. And so that is today she had stuff at BYU that she did for that graduation and tomorrow. So I'm in Heber City, Utah right now. And today I spent five hours today at a friend's uh, farm and we did a whole bunch of soil tests. We walked all of his fields and I, we checked his soil for all kinds of things to see how his soil was functioning. So that was super fun and wonderful. So he called me a couple of months ago and hired me to come do this. So I did that job today. So that was super great. And then I'll, I pulled soil samples and I'll look at those in my microscope when I get back home. But today we did tests to see the compaction levels of the soil. And we did species counts in his fields um, to see what kind of diversity was growing there. And we um, looked for any kind of life and insects and all those fun things that you look for to see if the soils are functioning. So I've decided that I love being a scientist. It was one of the funnest days of my life today. It was so great to go out there. And I've just got a quick story to tell you. And this is all relevant to what we're talking about because we need to have functioning soils, right? To grow food. So we did an awesome thing. So we were out in these fields and these fields have been tilled every year for who knows, decades, but a long time. And they've grown alfalfa and barley and uh, they've been pastures for cattle and horses. So over the years, they've had a lot of different things in them. But for the last seven or eight years, they've mostly been pastures. And so it was fun because I had my penetrometer, which is a machine that you, it's just a, it's just a sharp spike that goes down in the ground about two feet. And then there's a gauge on it, a pressure gauge. And so when you're pushing down in, if it hits a hard pan, then it will stop going in. And, but the pressure gauge comes up and it tells you how many pounds of compaction we have in the soil. And so we, we did all of that. And so I would stick that in the ground in about 20 or 30 places on each field to see how the compaction was. And, and the soils were really compacted, but he has along the edge of the field, he has some irrigation risers that come up, which is just a pipe that comes out of the ground that you hook your ir irrigation sprinklers to. And like 10 or 15 feet around those um, risers, that penetrometer went in the soil and it never got above like 200 pounds of pressure, which is, which is good. Like 300 pounds is, uh, roots won't grow through it. So you have extremely compacted soil, but most plants will grow in anything that's less than 150 pounds of pressure. Well, in most of the places I put it in, look, the soil has not been tilled up. It was awesome because this just went in. It felt like melted butter. They just went, it went all the way in the ground, all the like clear down, it plunged clear in. It was great. And it was so fun to see the look on this guy's face because through all of his fields, uh, there's many, many places and it wasn't even going in one inch and it was just hitting and it felt like concrete or rock. But, you know, this field is green. There's grass and alfalfa and all different types of plants starting to grow in the field. Uh, to look across the field, it looks like a beautiful green field, but it's very compacted. So I was sticking this penetrometer in there and there were so many places it wouldn't even go in an inch and it was reading 300 pounds, which tells us that this soil has real problems. And so it's going to be really hard for the soil to infiltrate water when it rains or when it gets, ir gets irrigated. It's going to be very hard for the beneficial microbes to be alive, to do the mineralizing so that you don't need to add fertilizer. And it's going to be really hard for water to get into the soil. So if you got a heavy rain, it would all run off and cause flooding and damage, um, you know, to whatever flooded. So uh, most of the acreages of this um, place, it was like a total of like 40 acres, maybe pushing 50. And, but, and it's broken up into um, four main fields. And so we went through all these fields doing all these tests. And it was um, wonderful to see that the only place where the soil was really functioning was on the edges of his field where the tractors had not been. And, you know, there was no tillage done. They had still been, they were inside the fence. So it had still been uh, 
been grazed by livestock, but the livestock grazing it had not caused the compaction. It was only where the tillage had happened. So this guy was, I mean, he already knew this. He came to my boot camp class last year, a year ago. And so he, he already heard me preaching this and that's why he hired me this spring to come out because he thought I could help him. So we went out there everywhere that he's not trying to farm it, it's functioning pretty good. And then everywhere that is being farmed and he's doing all the work to farm it, it's not functioning properly. So he was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? And, and he's, just, he's just smiling, thinking, wow, this is great. So it was super fun and it was, it was, uh, it was neat to see, you know? So there's just a fun story about something that happened to me today. Pretty awesome. So my wife, Vernie Lynn, is graduating. She's been working on this for, she worked on it quite a bit at the time we got married and before that. And then she has been working on it a lot the last couple of years. In between that time, she raised a family of wonderful kids. So it was pretty awesome. So she's uh, graduating with her um, bachelor's in psychology and so I'm so excited and proud of her and it's wonderful to be able to reach these life goals and in the world we live in we're going to need some good people who understand psychology because there's a lot of pain and heartache happening in our world today you already know that I didn't need to tell you that but, but this is pretty great so let's get on to seeds and seed saving so this slide that's up here right now, Ezekiel, you can see my slide, right? With these different yep. companies. Okay, good, thank you. So these are just companies that I love to get seeds from. I've ordered seeds from probably 50 different places in my life, maybe even more, because I'm a little nuts about getting seed. But in the last, like this year, uh, this year, I only, I think I only ordered from True Leaf Market, and they are in uh, Salt Lake City. I'm just looking at these to see. Last year, I ordered from almost all of these because there were certain varieties that I wanted. I got like one thing from Totally Tomatoes and maybe two things from Seeds of Change. But these are fun. So take a screenshot of this. These are really good companies, and there are other companies that are super good. You know, I, I just, these are just some of the ones that I've got seeds from. So here they are. Um, if you have favorite seed companies, great. But people are always asking me, where do you get your seeds? So I just put together this short list. Uh, there is one seed company on here I want to point out, and that is Uprising Organic Seeds. And they have a few varieties of some fantastic um, like watermelons and cabbages and some other things that I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, they travel extensively around the world, at least they have friends who do, and they uh, are able to collect seeds from different places, which I have not seen offered in any other, um, any other places. So look at Uprising Organic Seeds um, to see what they have, because they have some pretty neat varieties to work with. And when you're starting to save your own seeds, it's important that you, um, like if you want to start doing Landrace seed saving, I mean, I'm going to explain what that is later in just a few minutes. But if you want to do that, you need to start with a wide variety of different kinds of seeds. So if, say if you wanted to develop a sweet corn for your own area to grow, because maybe it's hard to grow in your area. And so you want to breed one that will do good in your area. Because so many times we say, oh, well, I just can't grow that in my climate. Um, I don't really believe that that's true. I think that we can breed really good fruits and vegetables to be able to grow in the climates where we live. Now, obviously, there's going to be some climates where you can't grow everything, but we can grow a lot more in the climates where we're living than maybe we think we can. So let me go to this next slide here. This is a picture of me and my friend Joseph Lofthouse. 
Um, Joseph is a chemist. Uh, he's a pretty highly educated guy. And he was working in the chemical world, um, you know, building things. And he always felt kind of bad about it. He didn't like it. And so he decided to just quit his job and go back home and start farming. He grew up farming. And so he thought, I'm just going to leave the corporate world. I don't like what I'm doing. I feel like maybe it's not the most moral thing because, you know, he was, he was making chemical concoctions for chemical companies and he could see that maybe it would hurt people. And so he just went home and, um, and started farming. And so that's one way he makes his living now is he raises great food and he sells it at farmer's markets. But the place that he farms is in Cache Valley, Utah, which is uh, where Logan, Utah is. And it's very cold in the winters, very short summers. They only have a 80 day growing season on a good year. Some years can be less than that. And what I mean by an 80 day growing season is uh, 80 days without a killing frost. So it's a short growing season and he wanted to grow a whole bunch of things that didn't grow there. All the uh, people who've ever tried to garden in Cache Valley would say, you can't grow cantaloupes. Um, it's very hard to grow corn and just all, and like tomatoes and peppers. There's all these summer crops that take a hundred days or more to get a really good crop. And he didn't accept that. He thought, well, I don't believe that. And he, he had a background in, you know, a lot, a lot of really great education. And he thought, why can't we just get the plants to, um, oh, what's the word, express their genetic capacity and let's get these plants to grow. And then he had chart, he developed a whole bunch of charts and he had breeding programs and he had, and we had the stacks of books to figure this all out. And so the first year he started, he got completely overwhelmed and frustrated. He's like, I can't keep track of this. I can see why people in plant breeding have an entire team of master's students and PhDs, and they'll have 30 people working on this to make it work because it's so confusing. And that's kind of a, how I saw plant breeding up until very recently, just a couple of years ago, when I met Joseph and he explained it to me very differently because he's been doing this for over a decade now. And so his big breakthrough was forget all the charts and forget all the education, forget it all. Because how did illiterate people for 10,000 years bring us the great varieties that we love today? And, and, you know, this was just kind of a thought that popped in his head one day, I guess, is that's how he explains it. And thought, these people didn't have PhDs. They didn't have master's degrees. They didn't have any education. They couldn't even read. These people are illiterate. I'm talking about people who lived 800 years ago, you know. Um, and so how did they do this? And there was really one criteria that those people had, and it was flavor. If a plant tasted really good, like let's say a watermelon or an apple or a cantaloupe or a squash, if it tasted really good, those are the ones they would save seeds from and plant the next year. And over time, they found that, well, not they didn't find, but the plants would simply just adapt to the environment where they were. And so let's fast forward to modern times and people tend to really love heirloom varieties. I love heirloom varieties. Um, most people who um, have some heritage in agriculture usually, have some varieties that they love. Um, a lot of people who have a heritage and family history may have a gardening variety that they love. A lot of people who love cooking and culinary delights and they love to be in the kitchen, love certain varieties to work with in the kitchen. And this is where heirloom fruits and vegetables get their real fame. And so say there's a tomato from, that was bred in Italy for you know 75 years or whatever. And, and they make a, a super good uh, pasta sauce or, or, or whatever you're cooking. And we take that from Italy, we bring it to the United States, a totally different climate, totally different set of pests and disease. And now this plant is struggling to grow. 
So I often love to ask people, uh, you know, when I'm talking about this, have you ever grown heirlooms and they tend to not do very good? You'll get a great big plant with two or three tomatoes on it if it's an heirloom tomato. And people always just kind of agree. But the consensus of the public is, well, that's just the way heirlooms are. But that's not really true because if you go to the um, homelands, wherever, uh, you know, because the homelands of heirlooms could be all around the world, but you go to the homeland of where that heirloom came from, and those heirlooms are prolific. They're big, they're beautiful, they're tasty. Uh, um, the, like everything about those heirloom vegetables have really good qualities. But when we take them out of their native land and we try to grow them in new climates with new growing challenges, they tend to struggle. So how do we deal with that? Because we want the heirlooms to continue to grow. We want them to thrive and we want those for our recipes. You know, our, a lot of heirlooms are all tied around family history recipes. My great, 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 great grand Mother had this wonderful recipe and it's been passed down. And now there's 900 people in her posterity and we all have this recipe and we all grow this tomato. And there's stories like that that are legitimate stories. And, but what you'll find is these people are scattered worldwide and in a place like Australia, it's growing pretty good. In, and then somewhere in Europe, it's growing pretty good, but somewhere else, it's not growing good. And why is that? Because the genetics are pretty much the same. And it's because they have not adapted to the regions of the world where they have been growing. So the whole point of this is we can produce brand new heirloom varieties. And it's pretty easy to do. And on this slide here, these are the four things that Joseph taught me. And he teaches many people around the country and he just published a book this year all about this. And um, I've been preaching the same thing, trying to let people know there are four main things you need. And they're right here on this slide. We need to understand first that plants make seed. That's a fundamental. Number two, the offspring of those plants will resemble their parents and their grandparents. Number three, sometimes a trait skips a generation. So if it turns out bad, don't throw it away, keep growing it, okay? Number four, select the seeds that taste good and have the other desirable traits. And so what would other desirable traits be? Let's say you plant something and let's say you plant a field of corn and you only get one ear of corn because let's say you have a harsh climate or you have really bad bugs, or there's a bad drought every year where you live. It could be a number of, it, we could list 50 things that could happen, okay? But let's just say one of those three. So there's one ear of corn that grows. Most people say, oh, that variety didn't work. I proved it, we can't grow corn in our climate. That's what 999 people say out of a thousand gardeners. But that simply isn't true. What you want to do is take that one ear of corn that did survive, plant it again next year, and in a field of corn, you're going to get 10 or 20 ears of corn. And so pick the one ear of corn that was the biggest, was the best flavored, that had whatever desirable traits you wanted, because what happened the second year? It started to adapt to the pests, to the droughts, to the problems. So the third year you plant it again, now you have a hundred ears of corn. And so you pick the very best ear of corn out of that. And then you plant it again. And usually by the time the fifth year rolls around, you have adapted a variety that you thought would not grow to your climate. Sometimes it can take 10 years to do that. And if you start with one variety of corn, then it usually will take about 10 years. So the way to speed it up is by adding more genetics into the mix. And so what Joseph did in Cache Valley, I will share with you 
his um, cantaloupe story. He did this with corn and tomatoes. He did it with like 20 different vegetables, maybe more than that, but a lot. But I'll share with you his cantaloupe story. He ordered a packet of cantaloupe seed and other muskmelons, not just specifically cantaloupes, but any of the muskmelon types that would cross pollinate. All right. So he had things that had green rinds, things that had orange fleshes, green fleshes, all different kinds of sh shapes and sizes of the, just these wonderful muskmelons. But they're all basically the same species, which means that they will share pollen with each other. Uh, uh, when the flower is open, the, sh the pollen will share, and then they will um, cross pollinate, and then he'll see what happens. So the first year, he planted a great big patch of these. I'm not sure how big it was, I, and I'm just going by memory, but I think it was about an acre. So he has hundreds of plants out there on this piece of land that I think was an acre. And the first year, that most of the stuff just died because the climate did not like it. And so most farmers would just say, oh, that was a failure and they would give up. But he kept irrigating it until the end of the season. And at the end of the season, I think he only had one cantaloupe, maybe two or three that had viable seed in them. But I know it wasn't five. It was just like, it was like one or two or three. And so they never ripened. So they didn't even taste good but they had viable seed in them. They got old enough that the seeds would sprout the next year. He kept all those seeds, he mixed them all up and he planted another great big field of them the second year. The second year, quite a few of them ripened and it's the very same as the corn story. So I don't really have to go through this again, but he picked the best ones every year. And I think on year four, he had a truckload to take to the farmer's market. And the uh, guy in charge of the farmer's market came and said, Joseph, you're breaking the rules. What are you doing? I'm going to have to kick you out of the farmer's market because you can't bring in fruit from another farm. He said, I grew these on my farm. He said, oh, come on. You expect me to believe that? Your farm's in Cache Valley. You didn't grow muskmelons in Cache Valley. And he goes, okay, come out to my field and see it. And so the guy went out to his field and he's like, I can't believe this you grew an acre of muskmelons and ripened them in Cache Valley and they actually taste pretty good. This is awesome. And so now think about this. Here's what he did. He had like, I don't know how many, I think he had a hundred varieties. Maybe he had 70 varieties. We would have to ask him for the details, but he had a lot of varieties. He didn't have like eight or 10. He had dozens of varieties. And what happens is that a lot of them just died and so they never flowered and they never contributed their pollen into that those first couple of melons that made seed. But when they did uh, make the, but, and so what, so what I'm saying is he widened the genetic capacity. Instead of having a very narrow genetic capacity where a plant is gonna maybe um, portray or, or exhibit maybe two or 300 traits, they were exhibiting thousands of traits, things like growing in cool nights, growing in the hot days, growing during the um, like wind storms, growing during like pests, uh, whatever um, diseases were there. So all of the climactic conditions of his farm the, the massive amount of pollen from all of the hundreds of different plants were, were spread by the bees to all the different flowers. And so now it has the genetic capacity of having, you know, being able to do amazing things that we can't even comprehend in our puny human brains. So like on year five, he had selected it so that his melons were like, they were pretty big, they were juicy, the flavors were superb, the seed cavities were small so that it was a lot of flesh in the melon. And so these are the types of things that um, he was able to do. So I heard him speak at the Utah Farm Conference and it was so fascinating to me. I thought, 
okay, of all the speakers I've ever heard in my life, there's like the top 10 who really are doing something that will absolutely change the world we live in. And he went in that top 10 group. And so after the conference, like three days later, I was at his house. It could have been a week later. I don't know. But I went to his house very shortly after the conference and I sat down with him and me and my wife and him, we sat down and we talked. I was going to say one-on-one, -on -one, but my wife was there. So whatever that is. So the three of us sat down and he explained in detail to me and taught me how you actually do this. Because in my mind, I just couldn't get past the fact that it's only these four things right here. Plants make seeds, re offspring resemble their parents. Sometimes this trait skips a generation and select the seeds that have the desirable traits you want. It can't be that simple. You have to have a team of PhDs and master's degrees to do plant breeding. But after talking to him, he finally got it through my thick head. But yes, it actually is that simple. If I have taste buds, and I can taste the food and it tastes really good and I'm excited about it and it, it thrills me. You know how when you, you haven't eaten a favorite food for say six months and then somebody makes it for you and they do a really good job and it's exciting to eat that dinner. That's, that's how he explained that that's how you're supposed to be um, selecting for the plants that you're growing. So on that trip, when I went to see him, I did one more thing. I got a packet of seed of every vegetable and fruit that he had. And so I brought that home and it, I don't know, it was like 300 different varieties. And so I came home and it was kind of expensive. You know, I, I bought those from him, but I was super excited about it. And I came home with the breeding genetics that that he has already figured out and been breeding some of those things. It's been over a decade that he's been working on these and some things it was only like two or three years into it, but most of them have been a long time. So, so that's pretty awesome. So I came home to uh, where I was living, which was Clover Valley, Nevada, and that's where I'm living now. And so I, I planted up a whole bunch of that stuff and to see how it would do in our climate and so let me just go to the next slide and i have some pictures of some of that stuff so when people come to my classes in clover valley i always try to teach them to breed these land races because if you're in a place that is hard to grow food this is something that anybody can do children with no education can do this in fact i think it would be easier easier to teach a child how to do this than somebody with a lot of genetic um, education because sometimes our education gets in the way i had to throw away most of what i have learned about plant breeding when i started doing this um, because i kept thinking oh i'm gonna make a chart i don't have time to make charts and have spreadsheets and i don't have six people working for me to each take a branch of that it doesn't make sense so doing it the easy way is the best. But here is the definition of a land race. And this is Joseph's definition. It's a locally adapted and genetically diverse plant or even animal that will thrive in your area. So when we think about honeybees in the, in the United States, the Varroa mite's about 20 years old. And people who have been taking really good care of their honeybees, um, those bees are still susceptible to varroa mites because we baby them, we take care of them, we medicate them, we do outlandish, crazy things to try to keep our hives alive so that the varroa mites won't kill our hives because varroa mites will kill hives if you don't do that. So, all of so 20 years after the varroa mite shows up, the beekeepers who have been taking super good care of their hives still have varroa mites. But the wild honeybees in the United States in 20 years have figured out how to be varroa mite free. The varroa mites don't kill them. So if you take a beehive and you go strap it up in the top of a tree where there are wild bees, then when those bees swarm and make a new hive, a lot of times they will like to go into a beehive. 
like if you put different essential oils in that beehive, it helps to attract them like lemongrass and other things that I, I don't remember the details, but there's ways to attract them. And then you can catch wild bees. But you don't have to do any babying to keep them alive. Like this is real. This is a reality. And so when we're thinking of raising our own seeds, how does this apply to our own gardens? If we are out there um, and every time we see the little bit of disease on our plants and we hurry and take care of that with, with some kind of a remedy, we are, and then we save seeds from those plants that were susceptible, we are perpetuating generations of plants that are susceptible to that disease. And we will have to take care of those diseases every single year. So I asked Joseph Lofthouse about this. What do you do? And he just laughed and said, well, if they're going to die in my garden, I let them die. And I only save seeds from the plants that will survive. I said, but you're going to have complete crop failures. And he laughs and says, yeah, for the first four or five years, you have complete crop failures. But if you have a big enough patch, like a quarter of an acre or half an acre or five acres of something, you will have one or two plants that somehow work out the genetics and then those are the ones you perpetuate. And it makes total sense. It's so simple and it's so easy to, to figure out. So never save seeds from something that does not have the genetics that you want. So this picture, this is me just saving some basil seed. So in my hand there are the little basil um, seed pods. And then I'm just crushing it with my fingers. And then the little black um, specks, those are the actual seeds. So when you're eating basil, let it flower. You know, I mean, if you have 10 basil plants, just let one of them go to seed. And if you taste each plant, like one leaf off of each plant, if there's one that's, that tastes better than the others, let that one flower and go to seed. And then when the seed pods dry up on the top, just pick those and just crush the the uh, plant, the dried flower plant part away, then your black seeds fall out. It's that simple. And then you want them to be um, completely dry and then you just store them in mason jars. So it's nice. Let's move on to the next picture here. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, I don't know what this is because there's like three plants that look identical. This is either collards or kale or, um, yeah, probably collards or kale. It's not broccoli because broccoli gets the yellow leaves before it gets that long. But broccoli flowers look exactly the same. Um, if the broccoli, sometimes broccoli could look that way, but generally um, the, all the flowers open before it gets that tall. So, I mean, cauliflower would look similar to this when they open. So, they, you know, so that's what they look like. So where are the seeds on that? Well, there are no seeds there. What you you have are the little um, flower buds and they are just beginning to open and you can see like five or six, maybe eight flowers there that are opening. Um, so there's another six to eight weeks before the seeds would be ready. So the flowers would get pollinated by bees or by wind and then the seeds would grow into a little seed pod and there would be three or four seeds inside each seed pod. And when the plant dries up and it's just looking like a big stick up there and these are gonna be like four feet high in the sky. They're gonna be a big tall plant at this point. And when they dry up, that's when you would um, pick off the little seed heads or you would cut the entire plant, um, dump it upside down in a five gallon bucket, shake it around a whole bunch, break the seed pods open. And then you would separate the woody seed pods and all the stems from the little tiny cute brown uh, brassica seeds that would be in there. So that's how you would actually save it from, from this, uh, this plant here. Okay, um, another thing that Joseph Lofthouse taught me is number four on this one. And you always get what you start with. So if there is a plant that is bitter, you are gonna get bitter offspring. If a plant is sweet, you're gonna get sweet offspring. So if you got excited about um, some of these breeding ideas I've been talking about, and you wanted to breed peppers, you would want to grow your hot peppers and your sweet peppers 
in two different fields. You would want to isolate them by, you know, maybe if you have a lot of active bees, you'd probably want to go about a mile apart. If you want, if you don't have a lot of active bees, then it might work out um, pretty good for you to just have them maybe a hundred yards apart um, so that the pollen doesn't, um, you know, they don't cross. But it would be, it would be a weird thing to be trying to breed big, beautiful red bell peppers. And let's say that you're frustrated with the thickness of the wall and bell peppers. And you think, why can't I get a bell pepper where when you cut that open, it's a half an inch thick and somebody should do that. So what I would do is I would order seed from every bell pepper you could find. You would want to order like thousands of bell peppers, big ones, little ones, all the different colors, all the hybrids you can find. Um, every, every bell pepper that exists and then mix up all that seed and you just plant an acre. You'd have, you know, 800 plants out there or whatever. And then as the pollen mixes, this is gonna be like an eight to 10 year program, but you would only select for the color you wanted and for the ones with the thickest walls. So every year you would plant those new, um, you would plant the seeds from the one bell pepper in that entire field that has the thickest wall every year. And of course, if it tastes bad, don't breed for that because the parents will resemble what the, the children have. So you, you would, it, flavor would have to come into that. And if you wanted them to be red, obviously we, you would only pick red ones. But if the thickness of the wall is your number one criteria, then it would always be a thick wall, but maybe it's okay if it wasn't a dark red. So you, you see, you could choose, you could pick and choose some of the different um, characteristics. Um, but just remember number four is huge. You get what you start with, but it would be a weird thing if you were doing that braiding project and you had mixed in some hot peppers in there. And so you were getting a big, beautiful, giant uh, bell pepper. And let's say in eight years, you got one that was a thick wall, but you couldn't sell them as sweet peppers because every once in a while, like one pepper out of five would be hot and it would burn you. And that could happen in a breeding program like this. So if you absolutely don't want a trait, then don't start your breeding program with anything that has those traits. So those are just some guide rules. But remember, remember what my friend Joseph taught me. People have been breeding these things and these people were illiterate for thousands of years in our past to bring us the great crops we have today. So we don't need to get overwhelmed with charts and spreadsheets and, our, and genetics and all that stuff. It's certainly great to know those things. And, and I do want people to get a lot more educated on you know, genetics. We need to know more of that stuff. But sometimes that type of education stops us from doing some of the most simple stuff. Okay, let me see what I've got here. I got some other cool pictures. Um, here's some Anasazi beans. I've been growing these. I grew these last year and I made a fantastic discovery the other day because last year after three killing frosts, the Anasazi bean did not produce beans in our climate. One, like this week, I went out to my place where I grew these last year and there were three plants in the ground and I checked these over pretty good last year after those killing frosts. And I determined that there were no viable bean seeds out there. And the leaves were black. They were hanging off the plant looking dead. And so something in the genetics of these beans right here made those beans like they somehow they grew and firmed up, there was enough energy left in the root systems and in the stems of those plants that it made viable seed after three killing frosts. That is something that I don't even know if that is scientific pos scientifically possible. So I have made an observation, which is 
like this week, which was insane. Cause I know I checked those plants last year and it had bean pods on there, but, and I felt all the bean pods and there was, and they were all just flat. There was nothing going on. So in the weeks after our killing frosts, we created some viable bean seed. I don't know if they will sprout yet. So maybe they're not viable, but I probably have 40 beans from those plants. And so I'm going to sprout every one of those this year. Because wouldn't that be fantastic to be able to grow a dried bean and have it have some cold resistance? Because beans don't have cold resistance. Except this is a variety that was found in an Indian pot. It hasn't been gone through generations and generations of modern breeding. Um, there's just people that have been growing it around the... Um, uh, where's that what's that place called Dove Creek area of Colorado right on the border of um, Utah by the four corners they grow these commercially down there they've been growing them for a few decades but originally the this gen, these genetics came from an Indian pot somebody found in a cave down there and so these still have wide genetics and and it it's it showed that this year so this will be fascinating to see if these grow um so here's another thing this is a this is a tiny, look how little that is. So these cantaloupes ripened in our climate. They ripened in 80, less than 80 days. And they had superb, wonderful flavor. And they're, they're about the size, between the size of like a tennis ball and a baseball. The bigger ones were like a baseball size, not a softball, but a baseball. So if you went to a farmer's market and you were going to buy cantaloupes, you wouldn't think of buying these little teeny things. But the, the flavor was superb. They were very, very good. So this is something that we have going on in our breeding program. And let's go to this next one. This strawberry ripened in January of this year during the cold freezing weather. And so that's pretty fantastic. And obviously it was in this greenhouse. So it's not like it was outside where it was totally frozen. So every day the sun comes and it shines through this greenhouse and it warms up, but every night it freezes. In January, it was, it was getting down to maybe, you know, 30 degrees. Um, some of the coldest nights, maybe 28 in this greenhouse. And these strawberries were not covered with a floating row cover. And they were right by the coldest part of the greenhouse, which is right by the wall, just right there next to me. You can see the strawberry plants at the bottom of the screen. But that one ripened in frozen weather. I picked it early in the morning, just as it was getting light. And I ate that and it was actually frozen, but it was extremely sweet and very good. I mean, who's playing with that kind of thing? But these are the things that home gardeners can do. Everybody can do this. Um, this is exciting. Okay, that is a butternut squash. And this came from Joseph Lofthouse's breeding over the years. So he, I got this is some of the seed I got from him. But look at the size of the seed cavity. Very, very small. Most butternut squashes are shaped different. The butternut squashes have a big seed cavity and the neck of the squash is like what? Eight, eight inches long, not very long. Well, this one, I didn't, I don't think I measured it, but it's almost two feet long. It's probably like 18, 20 inches long. I don't know, but it was super long and it had that little seed cavity. So I saved every seed from that squash. We got three of them that were like this, that ripened in our um, climate last year. I think I planted about 20 plants, but three, but we have a harsh climate for this kind of, uh, for squashes, for this kind of thing. But we, um, I saved, so from the three squashes I got, they were all kind of this shape with a small seed cavity, a big long neck. I only saved seed from one of them. And it was the one that had the best flavor. And I have one last picture here. And this is celery. I grew this celery all the way through the winter. And we were looking for any kind of special qualities that this had. And if I had a plant that had superior qualities by growing through the whole winter, I was gonna let it go to seed. Um, so I think I had about 15 of these growing. None of them really were super impressive to me. Um, they did well and we've been eating them through the winter. I'm still eating them now. They're growing back. I would cut the stalks off and they've been growing back. And some of them are starting to go to seed now, but I don't think I'll save any seed from these. 
because I didn't really recognize a trait that was like really important or really great um, that I wanted to save. So I'm not worrying about um, saving them. I mean, they did good, but there was nothing outstanding. So I'm just gonna um, take these out and, and we'll keep going. So, you know, it could be eight years before I let one go to seed. But if I ever grow one that is just really fantastic, then I will keep those genetics. And that's the type of thing you do with all the plants that you're growing. Choose the genetics that you want. Okay, let me spend just a minute on this. Um, boot camp is next week. I still have room for people in boot camp. Boot camp is $500. If you want to bring family members, there are discounts available. Text me and we can talk about some discounts for this if you if you are bringing multiple family members. It's a three-day event, April 28th, 29th, and 30th. We will be working in my greenhouse every day, and I will teach you how to grow food for your family and your community. This is for beginner gardeners and advanced gardeners both. And when you come to this event, you will go home knowing how to create a garden because we will create a garden from nothing to a planted garden while you're here. And I will show you how to do that and show you that is, is a lot simpler than you might think. And then uh, my 17 week farmer training, it is 17 weeks long. And this is to train you to have a career in growing food. And the way the world is coming apart right now we need more people growing food in our local communities. I understand this is 17 weeks. So if you have a life and a job, maybe you can't come, but you can certainly learn from me online on my Patreon page. But if you are a college aged student, or if you feel like Heavenly Father has called you to grow food right now, because we may see some famines that hurt people, um, come to this, arrange your schedule, come to this, and I can train you to go home with all of the, the skills you need to run a business in your own community to feed your community. And that could be on a, a big scale you, of feeding 100 people, maybe it's feeding 10 people. Um, and there are other um, things here. Uh, there's other events throughout the year. Please go to the website. On the bottom in red, it's highlighted in red there, it has information on all of these classes. There are fantastic classes on the ranch this year, taught by both me and uh, Jared to teach you how to be profitable in your farming and ranching and how to feed hungry people. So let's open this up for questions and I made a prediction that this could go for 20 minutes and it went for almost an hour. I think this was important. I do always try to just teach the things that I feel are important. And this went on for a while. So maybe it was important tonight. Hopefully that is true. Ezekiel, if you can read the questions to me, let's get into questions. And if you have any comments, we can discuss things. And the questions don't have to be completely about uh, like exactly how to grow a garden. If there's other related things, we can discuss those for sure. So um, go ahead and lead us out, Zeke. So the first question is very pertinent. Um, so Jocelyn Postma says, so with land race breeding, you could plant a bunch of varieties and minimize watering to come up with a drought tolerant plant, right? Yes, and absolutely. And more people need to be doing that because the droughts are getting worse. And I think we can breed crops quicker than the droughts are getting worse. So yes, yes. All right. Next question. Oh, the chat's flying and I can't keep up. Give me a second. Uh, next question. Do bees help with breeding plants, spreading pollen, etc.? Yes, absolutely. We need bees. And there are different species of bees that will pollinate different plants. And in North America, 
there are dozens and dozens of different kinds of bees. This is why it's so important to use zero man-made chemicals is because a lot of these um, creatures are very susceptible to chemicals. Now, I love the idea of organic gardening and organic farming and organic food, but I am not promoting organic and I haven't for a good decade because the organic certified pesticides, they kill all the bugs. Not all of those chemicals kill all the bugs, but some of them do. And it is very awful. And it's, it's wicked that, that we have um, pulled the wall over the public's eyes so that they believe that the organic label means it's better. Um, sometimes it is your best choice, but th there's a whole history behind that, you know, and I could do a whole, I guess I could do a class on that sometime if people are interested on the history of that, but I don't want to get into it tonight because it would take forever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I have a friend and he went out and he sprayed his organic stuff. He thought, okay, I'm going to certify organic. So I better start learning to use these products. And he used the product and he used it correctly and it killed all the bugs. It killed the lace wings and the ladybugs and the mantids and a whole bunch of other things. It, his earthworm count went down in the soil. There were, it, was, it was a disaster. And this is a common thing that's used today in organic farms and it should not be used. But the way that the United States Department of Agriculture um, labels organic and says what's good and what's bad and what you can use and what you can, can't use and all that whole horrific top-down approach of government, it has messed things up. Did I even answer the question or did I go off on a tangent? I don't remember the question. Uh, the question was, do bees help breeding plants and spreading pollen. Oh, so I yeah. think I think you went a little off the rail, but I think it was good. Yeah. So the answer is yes. Yes, the bees are very important. If you don't have good bees and other pollinators, there's other bugs besides bees that help pollinate. There's certain flies that help. Um, the point is, and the reason I went off on the chemical is because we need to be encouraging as much life as possible. Insect life, animal life, uh, plant life in our grow food growing areas. Okay, let, let's move on. Okay, next question. Looking, <clears throat> Becky is looking at moving into an area with bears. I was hoping to do pasture chickens, but don't know if an electric fence will be enough to protect the chickens. What can I do to improve my land with animals if I have bears in the area? Okay, so bears are fun, they're wonderful, they're great. It's awesome to see bears. You don't usually see them in bear areas. Um, so yeah, um, electric, uh, Joel Salatin teaches that the electric fences, the, the really nice nettings, you have a really good charger with a nice hot zap. Um, those will keep bears out. Um, you know, how hungry are the bears? Are the bears, is the ecology around where you live? Does it produ produce enough uh, of the wild foods, the natural foods that bears eat, so that it makes it easier to just eat their natural foods instead of coming in and eating your um, chickens. So that's something to look at and to think about. Here's another thing you could do. You could do two electric fences. So you have your main, um, like your main electric fence where you're moving, I'm assuming you're, pat you're moving your chickens probably every day. I'm just guessing. By, by saying pastured chickens, that's what I would think. So you're moving your electric net along through the field um, every day. Well, you could have another one that maybe goes around two or three acres. So a big area, and then you move your chickens smaller areas within that area. And then if you need to move beyond the bigger place, then you just move, make your net go more. And yeah, it's more upfront cost to buy more netting, but if bears are gonna eat your chickens, that might be a good way to do it. So they have more than one obstacle to fight with. Um, I've never had predation from bears and I have lived in bear areas. So I can't tell you firsthand experience anything that I've been able to do because I haven't had that problem. Okay, next question. Uh, slight comment on that last one. Okay. I have a lot of friends in Scandinavia who have to deal with some pretty big bears. Um, they use 
electric fences. And I, there's one guy, he actually has a video of a bear coming up to his electric fence that was guarding his sheep. And the bear put its nose into it, got shocked, ran away. It's the only time he's ever seen one. So I, yeah. I'm confident. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Next question, Ashley Wright. What defines an heirloom plant from other plants? Is it possible to make heirlooms not heirlooms? I've gotten about 10 versions of that question over the last week. So I, it's a pretty popular one to go into. Yes. You know what? My book's almost ready to publish. I'm so excited. So my book's going to be available very, very soon. And I have a chapter that talks about that. So there's, there's like different classes of plants. We know of um, open pollinated plants. Okay. That's one. And then, so an open pollinated plant is a plant that will just crossbreed with other plants within its species and, and they will grow. And if you only have one species of that plant, then you can save the seeds from that and plant them and they will grow the same thing every year. A hybrid is where you have two different, um, completely different like species, not species, but two completely different varieties. And then you, when you cross pollinate those, then the offspring of those, when you plant the seed the next year, then it produces something different. And then if you save the seed from that one, it will open up the genetics so that you, if, say if you planted a hundred plants, you could get a hundred different looking fruits from each plant because you've opened the bottleneck of the genetics. And that's exactly what we're doing with the land race breeding, but we're doing it on purpose to find the genetics we want that will adapt to the conditions we need. So heirlooms are an open pollinated plant that has been inbred. So it's been bred to itself or to its very close brothers and sisters every year for decades and decades and decades. And, and so during that time, it has adapted to the conditions where it is growing for like, for, you know, all the environmental conditions and the pests and the disease and all, all those things. And, and so when you take a, an heirloom, take it to a new place, it doesn't, it, the bottleneck, like it's gonna only exhibit a few of those traits because it hasn't expressed um, other genes for so many generations, it has forgotten how. So if you can get a, an heirloom to crossbreed with another heirloom or another open pollinated, or even a hybrid, it can open up those genetics. And so you would start to um, a land race breeding project to create a new, um, yeah, a, a new one, a new heirloom. Did that, did that cover what you're asking? I think so. Okay. So one other group would be the GMOs. So that's another group. And we haven't had GMOs around long enough to know the effects. We know some bad effects of GMOs. We know some good effects of GMOs, depending on what you're calling good and bad. But we haven't had two or 300 years of them growing to see, to be able to look past in history and say, yes, these are actually really good and safe and healthy and happy, or there are some real serious side effects. I mean, there's the popular debates that people like to get in about it, but the fact is they haven't been around long enough to have really a really good sound scientific um, understanding. But since we don't have that understanding, I choose not to grow them because why would I grow something that could have an adverse effect? So that's where I stand on GMOs. Okay, next question. Back to previous weeks. If we have poor soil and we put down three inches of compost and several inches of bark or straw, how would we plant the seeds? Oh, All yeah. the way down in the compost or do we have to plant starts? Okay, so if you're gonna plant seeds, you can start the seeds in that material, but the germination rate is lower because sometimes they dry out really quick in that material. So if you have a dibble, um, you, you, you may want to jump on my Patreon page. It's $8 a month. Just jump on there. And there's many, many videos of me showing you how to do this. In most of the videos, I show planting transplants because I choose to grow 100% from transplanting. 
um, the one crop that I don't do that with is corn. And so I will just make a, I'll make sure that the, where I'm growing the corn, that it's not a lot of big clumps. You don't want big pieces of wood chips. They need to be pretty small. And then I will just make holes down in, probably about two inches deep in, in, in your compost. And I know that I've said to put on wood chips, put on old hay, put on all that kind of stuff. If you're planting seeds, it needs to be a bed that's covered with compost so that the moisture is against that seed. Because if you just put that down in hay, it could be suspended in air. Even if you're sprinkling it and getting it wet, it's not wet long enough to get good germination of those plants, of the, I mean, of those seeds, so that the plant can grow. So if you are gonna plant with seed, put it in beds covered with compost. Avoid putting seeds in the wood chips and in the, um, anything else like hay or leaves or whatever else you've planted. If you are going to plant in the hay and the wood chips directly, then use transplants to do that. Go ahead, Zeke. All right, the next one is, how do we get rid of massive numbers of Japanese beetles then on our organic yard that devour grape leaves and roses. Yeah, 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 yes. You live in a city, don't you? Who asked this and where do you live? You're living in a city where there's epidemics going through because everybody's messing up the ecology. I'm looking for a slide real quick. Japanese beetles. Here's a slide. Okay, Zeke, can you see this good on your, from your guys' side? Yep, at least I can. Okay, so that's really long. Take a screenshot of this and then you'll have to probably type it in, but this is the coolest website in the world. This is where you go to figure out pests and diseases. But this is better than pests and diseases because once you get to this website, it will, uh, you can click on the pictures and there's a cool thing on the top of it, like a, like a, like, I don't know what it's called, like a menu. There's a menu up there and you can click on it and it says like roots, leaves, um, different parts of the plant. So if something's happening to a leaf, you can click on leaf and then it automatically brings up all the bugs that eat leaves. If it's something happening in a stem, click on stem and it'll bring up all the things that are happening or all the bugs that will, attack stems. And then you can start to narrow it down from there. If it's happening to roots, like there's that picture on here, you can kind of see it. I know it's little, but it, it shows that carrot and there's those black stripes on the carrot. That is not a fancy culinary carrot. That is a carrot that's attacked by the, the carrot root maggot. And so there are flies that fly around and, they, and the maggot goes down in the ground and they attack the carrots and drill holes through the carrot and begin to rot it. And so if you saw some kind of a characteristic on a plant, then you can go to this and in like 10 minutes, you can know as much as I know about a lot of um, pests and diseases just by clicking around and this will tell you everything you need to know. So this is one of the coolest websites ever. Um, so this is my recommendation. So here again, I have lived in such rural areas throughout most of my life that I have never really had a serious problem. Did you say Japanese beetles? I've never had a problem with those guys. I know they're a problem. I'm not saying it's not. It's just that I have lived in places that are far away from infestations. And so I've not had to fight with it. All right, Zeke, go for it. Next question. What is the difference between open pollinated and the alternatives to open pollinated? Okay. So open pollinated means that if you plant an open pollinated corn, for example, but like there's all, all plants are open pollinated if they make seed, it, it, unless it's been hybridized or unless it's been changed in a laboratory and it's a GMO. So heirlooms are open pollinated. That's why if you save um, seed from an open, excuse me, if you save seed
from an heirloom, which most people do because they want to grow it again next year, then it is open pollinated be, because it will breed itself. It will create its own offspring in the form of the seed. So that's what open pollinated is. So open pollinated can just be a random variety, but nobody has identified a, a great recipe with it or a culinary delight, or it has no family history or it has no national history. So nobody has said it's an heirloom because it doesn't have these other cultural um, identities or benefits. So an heirloom has all these cultural things associated with it, but it's still open pollinated. Does that make sense? So hybrids would be, um, I mean, they're, we don't call them open pollinated because they're hybridized but they will still mate or breed or transfer genetic material. Um, that's all the same thing with other plants, but open pollinated insinuates that they are going to, when you save the seed and plant it, it's gonna give you the same thing. The child is gonna look the same as the parent and the grandparent if it's open pollinated. But with a hybrid, the child could look very different than the parent or the grandparent and the great grandparent. Okay. If that wasn't clear, re ask a question and we can talk about it some more. Let's move on, Ezekiel. Okay. How do you recommend hardening off your seedlings so that you can transplant? I'm assuming okay. you're asking about not going into shock. Yeah. So, hardening off is a good thing. A lot of times it's popular for people to start their um, seeds in a window because they have a window and they're already heating their house and so 90 percent of the time when people do that the plants are starved from light they don't get enough light through windows so it's not really the best way to do it and your plants will get really long they'll get tall because they're reaching for the light a lot of them will be turning yellow they're not getting enough light so there's problems with doing that and so if you take those out of the house where you have this perfect cozy climate that's really nice for people as soon as you put them outside in the wind then it rips them to shreds and they're dead and so we need to go through a hardening off process which is where we would take them so here's how you do it you would take those plants outside for one hour every day for a week and then you bring them back in where they're cozy and so every day they're getting used to a new environment they're getting used to a fluctuation of temperatures they're getting used to the, the harshness of the sun, all the different colors of the ultraviolet light uh, that may not be coming through your window. Um, and the things like wind and maybe the cat jumps on them. I don't know, but, th but environmental things that are happening outside that are not happening inside the house. So one hour a day for about a week, five days to a week. And then increase that to about three hours a day for another five days. And then maybe four or five hours a day for another three or four days. See, by this time, these plant, that will harden them off good. But by this time, the plants are too old and they should have already been in the ground. So that's a good way to do it. And it will harden them off but it's, it's kind of, it's, it doesn't really work real good with the calendar of when we want to get them in the ground, but that's how you do it. So if, if you could figure out a way to like have a better system, if you could have a really good grow light that was giving them maximum light so that the plant stayed short, I highly recommend that. And then when you put them outside, the plant is much stronger so that when they go outside, they don't die. So the, there is one more thing you can do. Every single day, brush those plants. So if your plants are growing up there, you wanna brush those plants uh, with your hand back and forth so that the, uh, you know, so that you're just rubbing them, you're moving them. If you have a fan in your house and you can blast air across those plants, you know, that will dry your plants out quicker. So you'll need to maybe water more often but that movement of air going across the plants is gonna make those stems stronger so it's better to go out. Any kind of stress you can do. 
Um, a lot of times when I'm water, growing small tomato plants in a greenhouse, they've got good light, but they're going to go outside, so they need some hardening off. I will spray them with a pretty strong blast of a garden hose um, every day for about three weeks before they go out, and it will flatten those plants down, and people think I'm killing them. And I've had people work for me before who have been angry and said, quit doing that to your plants. Well, it didn't hurt the plant. It made the plant tough. When they went out, I never lost any of them because they had been through more abuse where I was spraying them down. Now, you can't spray them with a hard blast of water the first four or five times or it can kill them. But And so you, the first four or five times, you do it gently. And then as time progresses, you do it harder and harder. If you're blasting leaves off the plants, that was way too hard. But knocking them down flat, and then, you know, in two hours, they're standing back up again. If that's happening, that's going to make a very strong, resilient, tough plant. Uh, so there you go. Those are some ideas of hardening off. All right. So the next one is going to be if you are on a new piece of land and don't know the layout, such as spring runoff areas, et cetera, where do you recommend to plant a garden? OK, I'm thinking about that. We'll go outside and look at your ecology, look at your landscape, and figure out some of those answers. Just because you haven't seen the water runoff doesn't mean you can't figure it out. Go out there and look at where the hot, the top of the hill is. Look and see if there's a creek up above that's going to overflow and be spilling down. Um, look and see if there are um, like depressions in the ground that where no plants are growing. Uh, that probably means that water settles in there and that it's it has a concentration of salts in there. Um, look so it would look like a dead spot the soil may be a lighter color than where plants are growing next to it um, so just go out look at the landscape and let it teach you you know you're not going to learn everything you won't be as good as if you had lived there for a decade that there is a lot that the land will tell you um, look at the ground and see if there's debris um, you, you know how when water is flowing it will take leaves and sticks and little pieces, blades of grass that are dried up. And then when the water stops flowing, though that debris, that detritus will be collected um, in certain areas. You can see where it has washed the, the sand and the silts and the clays. So you can see a lot um, from just going out, spend you know 20 minutes and take a really good look at your property and it can teach you a lot. You don't necessarily want a garden to be in a super low spot. You don't really want it on a high spot. Middle ground is often a good choice. Um, if you have a dead spot, um, there could be a contaminant in the soil that is, then there's a reason plants are not growing there. If you have a place where the plants are growing pretty good, like there's in the middle of a lawn and there's a luscious growing lawn, that's a great place to grow food. But don't till it up and dig it up. Cover it with a couple of layers of thick cardboard and put your four to six inches of compost on top. Set your transplants in, water it every week, and you're off and growing food. Hopefully those were some ideas that would help. Let's move to the next question. All right. The next question is going to be, I planted peas in a 20-foot long pot, or sorry, a 20-inch long pot, and they are now getting tall. What would you recommend for novel trellising in the container? Recommend for trellising. Anything you have. Um, if you can cut some bean poles, stick them in the ground, you know, and they're just like going up there. The peas love to grow up just a just a willow stick, like a I just like to go down by a creek and cut those. Um, a, like just a fence post, a T-post will work. You could put, if you have multiples of those, you could put two T-posts in 10 feet apart and you could string strings back and forth and you could weave a lattice work. Um, you know, any, anything, anything that you have that you could, you know, um, there's not really a wrong way to do it as long as you're providing something for them to grow on. You may want to do something beautiful. 
you could weave something to make it look really nice. Um, you, or you could just do something simple like the stick. So yeah, I mean, the, the peas are, they're gonna produce food no matter what they're trellised on. So this comes down to more of an aesthetic. How do you want it to look? Do you want it to look um, beautiful and artistic or do you want, just want it to be functional and to work? Um, if they're in a pot and you're gonna keep them in the pot, um, you could put the pot up on a, put it up high somewhere, put it on a windowsill and let it grow down the side of your house. As long as you can keep it watered, if it was, you know, growing out of a window upstairs, you could open the window, attach that pot to your side of your house, we'll keep it watered every day from the upstairs window where you open the window, and then it's like just hanging down. I don't know how you're going to harvest it if it's six feet down, but, you know, that's not my problem. <laughs> you could get a ladder and climb up there, but like off the side of a, uh, uh, like a, like I'm thinking of like a deck it would work do you have a stone wall so they don't even have to trellis upward they could trellis downward and as long as the plant is healthy and happy growing in a good functioning soil and you're keeping it fed with whatever it needs in the soil and it's watered well it's going to produce good food so there's some ideas for you all right zig let's move on all right the next one is Oh, it changed the screen sharing and I lost I, my spot. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Didn't you find I had it? potato. Oh, I had potatoes sprout in my storage room. What do I need to do to prepare them to plant? Any other tips on growing potatoes? Okay, um, I'm assuming you're in North America. Um, it's probably potato planting time right now. If the potato, and you say they're sprouting, so. If they're a great big giant potato, potatoes, I kind of like them to be about uh, like the size of a golf ball is the perfect size of a potato to plant. So if they're larger potatoes, you could cut them into smaller pieces, maybe the size of a golf ball, but you need to have a sprout on each potato, like the eye of the potato, because if it's a piece that does not have an eye on it, they generally won't sprout. They'll just be in the soil for a while and eventually they'll decompose. So you want uh, one eye, at least one eye, but it can even have four or five eyes on a piece of potato. And then you just plant that down in your um, compost. So like if, if you've been making gardens the way that I've been talking about, where you're, uh, you have your six inches of detritus, whatever it is, um, just dig down to the six inches and put that potato piece right on the ground so that it's on the soil level and then just cover it up with your mulch and it will grow right up out of that mulch. And then when you go to harvest the potato, you want to harvest them before the leaves dry up and fall off. And then you can just grab the entire plant and, and just pull up the whole plant while the leaves are still green. So you're gonna wait until the flowers open and bloom because potatoes will have a flower on them. And then you'll wait another, you know, depending on the variety. I hate to tell you how many weeks because there's a hundred variables to that, but you're gonna wait like another eight weeks, probably six weeks, I, I'm not sure. But a while after that, when your potatoes are big underneath, then you just grab the whole plant and pull it up. Most of the potatoes come up and then you don't have to dig your, you don't have to dig it up. You don't need a pitchfork or anything. So it's super easy to grow potatoes that way. But um, we weren't talking about harvesting. You asked about planting, but that's how I plant them. I just, uh, I save all my little potatoes that are the size of a golf ball. And those are my seed potatoes for the next year. And usually you don't get disease in, in potatoes if you have a really good functioning soil. It normally doesn't happen. So, yeah, uh, let's move on to the next question, Zeke. All right, next question. With potatoes, how do you cut the sprouted potato to plant? Do you let the cut dry out before planting? Um, some people say you should let it dry out. Other people say you shouldn't. It's a big hot debate in the potato world. I've grown them both ways with success. Once in a while, one will rot if you don't let it dry out but I have also had them dry out and they rotted that way too. So I don't even worry about it. I just will cut those big potatoes up 
um, in like the size we just talked about, make sure there's an eye on each piece and I plant them. Sometimes if you sprout the, like if the sprouts are really tall, like the little eyes have started to grow, you can plant potatoes with long sprouts. They will still grow into a productive plant. So yeah, next question. Next question. What kind of water setup do you use in your garden? Drip line, irrigation, or the above watering, et cetera. Are there times that it's better to use one type of watering over another? Um, okay, yes, there are times when it's better one over the other, and I'll tell you. But I use sprinklers and I use drip line. I like drip line. It's very, very good. Uh, but I really like sprinklers. And here's the pros and cons. In a greenhouse situation, I like to have drip lines and sprinklers on the same piece of ground because in a greenhouse, things can get dusty and dirty. And I don't like to pick lettuce and cabbages and broccoli heads that are dirty. And then you take them in the house and they're covered with dust. So if you only have drip line, they can get dusty because the natural rains don't um, wash them off and you usually have less wind to blow the, that dirt away in a greenhouse. So it's nice to be able to do a lot of watering with the drip, but when things start to get dusty, I'll turn on the sprinklers and there's a nice rain in there. So that's a good way to go. Um, if you're trying to create um, like green beans, they need to be pollinated. So all you got all your little flowers in there and they're opening up. And if all you have are sprinklers and you're sprinkling those and, let, and green beans are a hot weather plant. So you might be sprinkling three or four times a week to keep them watered. Well, the pollen gets messed up and washed away every time you sprinkle. So during pollination of flowering crops like green beans, tomatoes, other things, I like to just have the drip lines going because the pollination is a lot better, which means we get a lot more fruit. And remember, if it grows from a flower, it's a fruit. So yes, a green bean is a fruit. All right, next question. All right, next question. Is it okay to grow potatoes from a store? Yes. Next question. <laughs> Uh, th so the next question, this is when I got in an email over the week. What are effective measures that people in drought stricken areas can take to help their water cycle return to health? This comes from someone in central Utah concerned about the new emergency droughts and all of that. Okay, read the first part of that again. What are effective measures that people in drought stricken areas can, can take? Okay, got it. I got it. Okay, cover the ground with mulch. Cover the ground. We have to think of the soil, the, the, the top layer. So the soil has all the different layers. We talked about the five spheres within the soil. The top sphere, and if you weren't on that class, it's one of the recordings on my YouTube channel. You can go back and watch that. But one of the spheres, the very top one, is the, the detritus sphere. That's the organic matter layer on top of the soil. You should never actually see the sand, silt, and clay particles. You should have to move back the detritus sphere. Detritus would be like dead plants, wood chips, compost. Um, if you're in a bigger agricultural um, situation where you have acres that you're dealing with, it can be very hard to put inches of this type of thing on the land. So what you're gonna have to do is grow it and then let it die and, and flatten it down. Uh, in the regenerative agriculture world today, they are manufacturing hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of machines are being made. They're called rollers, a roller crimper. And there's different types and different kinds. So what you would do is you would uh, grow a crop of, let's just pretend you grew a cover crop that had a mighty mustard, daikon radishes, um, oats, wheat, and vetch, and rye. So we have six plants in there, and you probably need 20 more. But let's just say you have those. Okay, let's throw in sunflowers. So you have all those crops in there on 10 acres of ground. You would take your tractor in there with a roller crimper, and you would drive back and forth across that field. And in that field, 
it would um, it would just smash those down and it will kill those crops. And you have to do it at the right time when the crops will die if you do that, so they're not growing back. So the roller crimper smashes them flat on the ground and then you can come behind it, directly behind it, and you can plant a crop of corn or soybeans or watermelons or pumpkins, whatever you want to plant, you can plant the very same day, okay? Now, don't just go crazy and start planting everything and think that that's gonna work. You need some mentoring on that. I'm available for hire to do that technical work because you need to know that when you roll or crimp it, you're not gonna have a whole bunch of plants that just keep growing and because then they compete as a weed with these other crops, like your watermelon crop that you would grow. But what you're doing is you are covering that soil. You're getting that skin layer on the soil. So that's a really, really good thing to do. You've got to cover the soil. That's the number one thing. If you only can do one thing for soil health, cover the soil and keep it covered. Keep it covered with dead plants. Keep it covered with living plants. All right. Ezekiel, let's move forward. All right. So the next question is, and this is actually one from earlier we missed. Uh, why, what, why did you decide to put your compost in a shipping container? Oh, yeah, because we had a shipping container. We didn't have to purchase it. We already had one. Therefore, it made a good root cellar. So it's not just in a shipping container. The point is it's under the ground where it will not freeze. Because when microbes freeze, they die. Not all microbes, but I didn't want the microbes that I had grown in my compost all summer to die because then next spring we start over to grow new ones. So they're in the shipping container that's buried in the ground like a big root cellar so that the microbes don't freeze and it keeps them at a temperature in like in the 40s and 50 degrees pretty much year round. And that is a really nice, uh, it's dark, it's cool, it's constant. And I water it about once a week to keep everything at 50, or I mean, around 70% moisture. And then uh, that's the perfect condition for the, the beneficial bacteria, a protozoa, fungus, microarthropods to grow and to thrive. And then I add earthworms. So there's a lot of earthworms growing in there now. Maybe some incatraids will show up, maybe some other things. So those are the all the things we're growing. And then we will take some of that out and use that compost to inoculate the fields and the gardens and the orchards and everything so that we have a really good functioning soil. So to make a long story short, so that the compost won't freeze. Okay, next question. Awesome. Where's a good place to get cover crop seeds in bulk? Okay, so there's a place, if you're in like, if you're close to Utah, I know a lot of people on this or in Utah, um, there's a place called, um, oh, what's it called? It just skipped my mind, Utah Seed. I think it's called Utah Seed. They'll mix it up for you. So like, uh, it, I would just call them, call them on the phone, Utah Seed, they're on, I wish I had a, I should make a note. Ezekiel, help me make a note. I don't have a way to make a note because I'm not in my normal place. If you can make a note for me, I'll try to find the website and I'll, get it on here next week for you. But Utah Seed is what they're called. But if you called the guy and you explained to him what you're doing, um, he could mix a bag of seed for you. He deals with large amounts of seed. So if you're just a home gardener, yeah, I should tell you. So two things, if you are like a couple of acres or bigger, Utah Seed's the place to go. If you're a home gardener, then you probably can just get the seed from, uh, Mountain Valley seed, all the, you know, they have a, a pretty good array of good cover crop seeds to build the soil and to feed the microbes. Is Mountain Valley called True Leaf now? Yes, same place. Thank you for that clarification, Ezekiel. True Leaf Market and Mountain Valley are the same, except they just changed their name. But for 10 years of my life, they were Mountain Valley and I haven't, <laughs> I haven't got to where I remember. Okay, next question. Okay. 
I heard in the Pilgrim story that Squanto planted corn with fish. What are the pros and cons of planting with fish, and do they also apply to other meats? Okay, so that is totally true. Fish are filled with a lot of wonderful things. There's a lot of micro, uh, like micronutrients in fish, and it's not so much the fish, it's the fact that the fish came from the ocean, and the ocean is filled with all kinds of wonderful trace elements. So if you used fish, um, it's going to be, they're going to have a lot of long carbon chains, which is going to be a fungal food. So what you're actually doing is you're helping your fungus to grow uh, by using fish. So yeah, I mean, if you can get fish, it's great. You can buy a product called fish hydrolysate and you can get that at almost like any garden center. And it's just the fish fertilizer, fish emulsion. Some people call it fish emulsion and it's a good fertilizer. Um, what are the cons of using fish um, it stinks so if you want your garden to smell like rotting fish if it, you know it, it could be stinky it could attract um, wild animals that you don't want it could uh, attract neighbors pets you don't want people uh, not people but you don't want um, the neighbor's cat or dog digging up your garden and then even worse than that they're going to take the rotting carcass back to their owner's house and so, th th so those are some cons to think about. All right, next question. All wait, right. Wait, wait just a second. He said, the question said other meats. Um, so other meats, they would be, a, all meat would be a high nitrogen source, but other meats would not have the same trace element content as fish from the ocean. So usually in all the gardening books, they say not to make compost with meat but usually it's it's not that it doesn't make a good compost it's just that it stinks and it makes enemies out of your neighbors uh, but it would be a high a high nitrogen you know component okay next question all right we're going to be away for six weeks from the beginning of may to the middle of june what suggestions of what could be planted and put on a drip line or would it be best to plant for a fall harvest? Um, two, two things I would do. Either make some good friends who want to take care of your garden while you're gone. I would not trust the drip line and a timer. Too many things can go wrong. So just either get some friends who can help with that part of the season or just plan for a fall garden when you get back. If you don't want to have to deal with making friends who are going to do that, <laughs> that sounded really weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> But if you're if you're not in a position to do that, just get the just plan on a fall garden. That's what I would do. All right. What is a good amount of compost to feed each plant when transplanting your starts and throughout the growing season? OK, read that again. I'm sorry. Um, what is a good amount of compost to feed each plant when transplanting your starts and throughout the growing season? Okay, so yeah, just like if you're planting tomato plants and peppers and watermelons, whatever, I would just put like a half a cup of compost in the bottom of the transplanting hole. So dig the hole, put a half a cup of compost in there, mix it with the soil that's in there, put your transplant in there, that could work. Um, now, if you, if you have good compost that's filled with really good microbes, that's gonna work. But if, if your compost is not very good, meaning it doesn't have very many microbes in it, you might want more than that. Uh, but that's a, that's a place to start, a cup, a half a cup, that would work. Okay, next question. Okay. Um. A few weeks ago, you talked about making a compost and soaking it in water and using that water infusion on your plants. I just need clarification as to when to use compost versus an infusion versus a compost tea. Okay, so um, they can be used interchangeably. Here's the main thing. If you have a small amount of compost and a large area to cover, then you would want to make the compost extract because then you can stretch out your compost to cover 10 times or maybe 50 times the amount of land. Okay, so that's where the distinction is. Now a compost extract 
you simply slosh the compost in the water for five to 10 minutes, and then you have an extract. A compost tea is a complicated process where you put some compost in a large amount of water, and then you would agitate it with moving air through the compost. So you would bubble it like with a fish bubbler for a period of 24 hours. And you would put foods in this water to feed the microbes so that you are multiplying the microbes. And you are, and so you start out with one bacteria and you end up with 100,000 bacteria. You start out with one fungus and you, and you end up with 20,000 fungus. You start out with one nematode and you still have one nematode because it takes two weeks for them to reproduce. So they wouldn't, that wouldn't even work in a compost um, tea. But I say that because some people say, oh yeah, your nematodes are gonna increase. Well, that's not true because a nematode's life cycle is two weeks. But uh, it's, so, but the tea, so this is important. The tea is for planting on, excuse me, let me start over. The tea is for spraying on plant leaves. And that's what it's for. And that's where it's really effective. The extract is for putting on the surface of the soil or injecting into the surface profile, the soil profile down deep in. And then the compost solids you just put that on the surface of the soil around your plants. So hopefully that clarified kind of what that's about. Okay, next question. All right, next question. Do you open your greenhouse to let pollinators in? Yes, I do. Cool. Is it possible to grow plants that commonly grow in water in soil? Are you give me an example? I I need an example. Please type in the example. Ashley, uh, you, you want to jump in there? You could even you could even just unmute and ask me. I guess that's totally appropriate. <laughs> I'm thinking of watercress. Ashley says cattails and seaweed. Cattails and seaweed, nope, you'd have to grow them in water. I don't think they would grow out of water. They need a lot of that water, so. You know, if you're finding a plant that you like and you're wanting to use it, what you wanna do is you want to mimic the same environment that it's growing in in nature in your own gardens. When we start manipulating plants completely out of their own, uh, you know, their environment, and we create a whole new environment, it becomes really hard to grow those plants and make it work. So, yeah. Okay, next question, Ezekiel. Next question, can you, re can you reuse the compost after you make it into an extract? Oh yeah, you can. So you would have the, like a really good way to do it is you get a screen, like a, you can go to any hardware store and you can buy a paint um, strainer and it's just a mesh bag that goes in a five gallon bucket and they're super cheap. You can just get those almost anywhere. And so I put like one handful, which is maybe a half a pound of compost into that strainer. And then I just slosh that around in the five gallon bucket. And then you are able to, uh, and then the solids are still there. So I just put those solids after I use them, I just put them back on the top of my worm bin and they go all the way through the worm bin again because most of the most of my compost goes through a worm bin before I use it in the first place. So the worms eat it all. Well, I just put it back in there a second time. They eat it all again. And then when it comes out again, it's filled with all the good microbes again. Because as we're making the um, extract or tea or whatever, it is... Uh, we wash a lot of those microbes off. That's what we're extracting off. We're extracting the, the ulnic acid, the humic acid, the fulvic acids, and the, all the different microbe groups that may be growing in there. 
So, so yes, at that point, you once you have that compost, put that around your plants as a food for the microbes in your garden on the soil surface, or just put it back in your composting system to recompost again. So absolutely, you, you would not throw that away. That's way too valuable to just to just dispose of. <clears throat> okay, Zeke, what's what's next? Where can we find your compost tea recipe? Um, on Patreon, on my Patreon channel. That's my that's my uh, eight dollar a month subscription. But I'll just tell you right now, since you asked, the the compost tea recipe is you would make like take a, an amount of water, like 10 gallons of water. That's what it was, right? Ezekiel compost tea recipe? Yes. Okay. So you'd take like 10 gallons of water and you'd take like one pound of, uh, of a compost and you would make an extract. So I already, I just explained how to make the extract with the strainer. So the solids go back into the compost, but now you have extracted about one pound of compost which is about a, a one or two handfuls of compost and so you pour your compost extract into the tea and then you would bubble it so you get, move a lot of air through it and you need to keep moving the air through it for a long time then the best foods to put in that would be maybe a tablespoon of humic acid and you can get the humic acid and this is going to be like a dry product like pellets and you can buy those there's suppliers you know in gardening places and on the internet and they just look like little lumps of dirt and uh you would put those in there and then maybe like a table so a tablespoon of humic acid and a tablespoon of kelp and if you're using kelp like fresh kelp that you gather up on the seashore. If any of you are, are on here from Oregon or Washington or any along the coast, if you gather your own kelp, uh, you would want to wash it really good until it doesn't taste salty anymore. Wash the salt out. So you would massage it in a bucket and wash it and rinse it with four or five rinsings to get the salt out of it. And then just kind of bite it and taste it. And when it tastes like most of the salt is gone, then it would be appropriate to use. But most people just buy some kelp from wherever, human grade kelp to eat or, or just, you know, kelp for gardening. So that would work. Uh, seaweed and kelp are the same thing. So, so that's it. Awesome. Super simple. Okay, so my starts and pea pots aren't doing well. Uh, why? My plastic pot plants are doing great. Okay, so if you're treating them the same, they're probably drying out too much because the, there's probably not enough moisture in the soil. That's what I'm guessing. The outside of those peat pots should be moist to the touch all the time. If you're picking those up and they feel dry, then they're dry probably all the way through the soil. So that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head without, without actually seeing them and looking at them. But assuming that you're treating them the same, then that's the only thing that would be different. What's the easiest compost making method for beginners? Um, I have extensive videos, probably 30 videos, maybe more than that on my Patreon page. If you jumped on there, you could just watch all those videos. I know that times are hard and if you can't afford $8 a month right now, just pay the $8 once, watch them and then unsubscribe. And, and that could help you. The videos are already there, they're ready to go. And it shows you the easiest methods to, to do that. I really am only showing one method on there, just a lot of videos about the same ones, but you'll have access to, to the like, well, way over 200 posts. Most of them are um, videos. I do have some articles on there too. So that would certainly help you out. I mean, it would take me an hour to explain it right now. That's why I'm not telling you. It's not that I'm trying to be greedy for $8. It's just that it's already done. The work's already done. And that's an easy way to get it. So, so that'd work. 
for you. Awesome. Uh, where's a good place to get good worms for a worm bin? From me. I sell worms. I got lots of them. You can just shoot me an email and tell me you want worms. I sell my worms for $40 for a pound of worms. So you would um, Venmo me $40 with your address and I'll ship you some worms in the mail. So, but if you don't want to get them from me, just get them off of Amazon. Or there's, I don't know, drive up and down your the street and look for people's signs in the yard that says worms for sale. <laughs> Not very many people have a sign like that, but I've seen more than you'd think. Just driving through Salt Lake, I saw three, which is pretty funny. So, yeah. All right, next picture. I'm not pitcher. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I got up at three o'clock this morning. It was great. We drove over here and did everything. So I'm getting tired. But next question. Can you put bones in a compost or in soil? Is it helpful? Yeah, if you're going to use bones, I would try to come up with a way to crush them first. So, I mean, bones are pretty tough. They're hard to crush. But yeah, bone meal is something. It's a great soil amendment. It's full of calcium and a lot of other things. So yeah, bones are good. I wouldn't throw them away. I'd compost them. Here again, if you're in a, in a situation where you're living in a city with lots of neighbors around, they'll take a long time. They can take years to break down and they can stink like rotten meat while they're breaking down. So you need to just think that through before you start to do that. But you can take a sledgehammer and smash up a bunch of bones and then just throw them in your compost. Yeah. All, All right. right. Next. Next question. Is it better to cut plants when you are done with them or to smash them down and leave them? Cut plants when you're done with them or smash them down. I think she means the difference between going through with like a with like a lawnmower type thing versus a roller. It doesn't matter if like if you have a living plant and you're trying to terminate it before it goes to seed, like I explained earlier with the roller, you don't want to cut it because it will stimulate it to grow back. If you're using a roller crimper, then that then it's it's gonna um, it's gonna terminate them, meaning kill them without them growing back. As long as they're at the right stage of growth when you do it. So, but as far as soil health goes, I don't care what you do. Just leave all as much of that stuff on the soil as you can. The, one of the biggest problems we've done in modern agriculture is we remove all the plants all the time. So, and it, it's hurting our soils, which makes it more expensive to grow plants, which causes famines, which is one reason the world is the way it is right now. Okay, next question. Next question. Where do you keep your worms? Okay, so I have a big box. It's four feet wide and 16 or something feet long, maybe 18 feet long. And it's two feet deep. And it sits up off the ground on stilts, two feet high. And then on the bottom, it doesn't have a solid bottom. The bottom is just a bunch of pipes going across the four four feet width across and there's a four inch space between each pipe and so what I did when I built it is I put cardboard right on top and then I filled it up with a bunch of compost and then I just added in tons of worms on top because I already had the worms so I put in maybe a hundred thousand worms on top because I just added a compost that was filled with worms and then on the bottom of that like one inch above the pipes there's a track that goes through there with a blade that goes across the four inch side, like the four foot. So the blade is four feet long, right? And so I can pull that blade across, but I have to use a winch to do that. You can't pull it by hand. So I hook a winch on it and the winch pulls it across and then it pulls it back and it cuts the one inch of compost of the bottom of it off. And it goes down and it hits the ground. So this is a big elaborate thing that may be too big and giant for most home gardeners, but it works pretty awesome for me. So that's how I have my worms. 
if you just want to have a worm farm, you could just do it like in a, if you could get like a 20 gallon tub, like a, if, if you have ever bought like a mineral um, tub for cattle or horses, just like a watering trough that's like a foot or two feet high, or maybe a couple of feet across, just a tub, you know, um, put them in that and just put your compost in there and then put your worms in there. But you want to keep your moisture at about 70% moisture. If it gets too wet down in there, the worms will die. So it's the same as making a compost to have a worm bin. You give, feed them the same stuff. So it works good. So if your compost is stinky and, it's, and it doesn't smell good, it's going to be going anaerobic and that'll kill your worms. So it needs lots of oxygen in it. So there are some ideas about worms. Hopefully something was helpful. If not, we can keep talking about it. What's next, Ezekiel? All right. Oh, one second, I went down further. Is there a difference between fishing worms and worm farm worms? Yes, yes and no. There's two breeds of worms that are really good for worm farms. Uh, most species of worms do not like to be in high concentrations. And so they try to get away from each other unless they're mating. It's the really the only time where they're together. But there's two species that are really good for um, worm farms because they like to be in high concentrations. And that's what you want for your compost and your gardens are those types. So I'll tell you the Latin names. There's Icenia fideta and Icenia pertensis. Those are the two kinds. The common names are red wigglers or European night crawlers. And if you get on the internet and look up worms, you'll see both of those for sale. And I have both of those and I just think they do better if they're in the same um, environment. So when you get worms from me, they, uh, they're mixed up, you'll get both species. All right, next. All right. Should you leave your bones raw or is it okay to use bones you cooked with? Either way. It's okay either way. Yeah. Awesome. How would you care for or introduce worms into a garden? And okay, so, also, how do you start a worm bin? Okay, so um, if you want to start a little worm bin, just put some uh, peat moss in the bottom, like two inches of peat moss in the bottom of a container. And then get it nice and wet, and then you can put your worms in there. And then, like once a week, add another couple of inches of a compost that's mostly composted and done. So old dried rotten leaves can go on there, grass clippings can go on there, all that kind of stuff. So I would add an inch or two every week, and they'll just go through it and eat it. So that's how you start a worm bin. What was the first part of the question? I forgot it. The first part of the question was, how would you care for or introduce worms into a garden? Okay, so worms need the same thing as any other livestock. They need water and they need food. And if they have water and food, they'll be happy. So if you create a garden the way I've been telling you, where you don't till the soil, because tilling the soil will kill worms. So don't till the soil and you're covering the soil with uh, somewhere around three to four to six inches of a beautiful detritus sphere, which I'll just repeat it again. It's um, just dead plants. So it's compost, it's grass clippings, it's just dried up dead material and you keep it wet. So you're gonna be watering this a couple of times a week to always keep it moist. If you have that, then your worms are gonna be happy. And so you just stick your worms in there. Just dig a hole and plop your worms in there. If you have a long garden, let's say you have a long bed that's three feet wide and 100 feet long, then I would take like 10 worms and I'd put 10 worms every five feet throughout that whole garden. And then you've introduced your worms. So I would pull it back like three or four inches deep and put them down in there and then cover them up. And you don't want your worms to be exposed to sunlight. You know, 15 minutes in the sun and a worm is dead. You've killed it. It may not look dead, but it will die from the injuries. So always keep them dark. All right, what's next? Is your worm bin on Patreon and how do you harvest the worms? Uh, yeah, so yes, I have quite a few videos on Patreon about the worm bin. 
And I just, when, so here's how I, I don't, sometimes I will harvest out of that worm bin, but lately I've just been harvesting from my garden beds. So between my plants, I will put down cardboard and there's nothing on top of the cardboard because I already have my layer of like a couple of inches of compost or whatever. And then my plants are growing out of that. But my plant, like cabbage plants are a foot apart. So I will put cardboard between that. So just like the leaf of a cardboard box and I'll have 10 or 15 of those in my greenhouse. And then every time I water, it waters that cardboard. So the surface under the cardboard is moist. So all I have to do is go out there, pick up that cardboard, and there's usually 20 or 30 worms just on the surface, and I'll just pick those up real quick. So that's how I've been harvesting lately, and it's been working good. If I need more worms, I'll put out a bunch more cardboard, and I'll water it, and with and the next day, like, you know, 12, 15 hours later, there will be a bunch of worms there. So if I get an order for worms, I'll just go put out a bunch of cardboards on my beds, and then the worms come to the surface under the cardboard. I move the cardboard, I pick them up, and away we go. There's no digging, there's no electricity, there's no chemicals, because there's a lot of weird ways people will harvest worms, but, but that's how I do it. No, it's been working great. All right, next. All right. So the next one is another one that I got to my email over the week. Okay. Are droughts like the one that the Western U.S. is experiencing a natural part of the area's water cycles? Yes and no. So in water cycles, you always will have, you'll have um, decades of dry and decades of more wet. Maybe not decades, but you'll have years that are dry and wet. But over the last um, hundred years, the cycle has been going, like we'll have wet cycles and dry cycles that do go up and down, but overall it's been getting drier and drier and drier and drier. So the droughts we're having now are the worst droughts we've ever had in history. So um, yes, they are, they are natural cycles that are happening, but they are also absolutely affected by management that people are doing. And um, one of the greatest quotes from one of the smartest ecologists alive today is, bare ground causes drought drought does not cause bare ground because people think oh the drought is terrible all my grass is dying out and it's we and it's because it just doesn't rain and that's what we think most people think that but it's actually backwards the reason it's not raining as much is because we are creating more bare ground largely by overgrazing um, the grasslands, because the Great Basin Desert is a grassland. We can dig down and do soil profile analysis, and we have the deep carbon um, in that ground, sometimes six feet, eight feet, 10 feet deep. And the only thing that really creates that in, in, in like the specific ways that I'm talking about, which I haven't explained because we don't have time to do that tonight. But grasslands is what creates those um, deep profiles. But we go out here and we, and you know, people who've been living on the land for 80 years say, oh, this has always been sagebrush. There's never been a grassland here. But yet we hear stories from the Native Americans and they say, yeah, there, this used to be a grassland. And so it's the early grazing that, the, that happened that created the bare ground and then it lessened the rainfall and and these are this is just you know this is what is happening so we are creating the deserts um, of the earth that used to be grasslands and so uh, you know i don't know i could talk about that for hours and hours and hours i've been doing a lot of research on that in the last years like the last five years, a lot, the last, especially the last two years, even more. And it, it's fascinating how that works. So, um, so what do we do to stop overgrazing? And like 999 people out of a thousand people will say, we, we need less animals grazing. And that is the worst thing we can do. We actually need more cattle on the rangeland 
but they may need to be managed differently because when you have a high concentration of large numbers of animals and they go through an area, it will stimulate the growth of grass like nothing else you've ever imagined. There's nothing a human can do to make grass grow the way that a, a herd of a thousand buffalo will make it grow or a herd of a thousand beef cattle or dairy cattle, any kind of a, a, those big, large, heavy animals, they will just make it grow like you can't believe. Um, and there's proof. I mean, you get online, look up Alejandro Carrero from um, the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico. He has a 20,000 acre ranch and he has created rain where rain used to not exist because it is covered with grass now because of the way he moves his cattle. So we need more cattle, not less cattle. So there's a lot of people in government right now um, who are very interested in environmental things and their solutions are absolutely backwards. They're trying to remove cattle from the, the world and that will create, if they actually did that, we won't even be able to have human life on earth anymore. <laughs> because everything will turn to desert. Not everything, but the, the big continents will turn to desert. I mean, your, your rainforests are probably still gonna be rainforests, but anyway, there's a lot of ramifications. I'm not gonna get into this because it's getting late, but hopefully that kind of answered your question. Next question, Ezekiel. How much more time do we have? We're, we're out of time. It's, it's been over two hours. Okay, this is the last one that came in tonight. Uh, okay, let's just do that one. And then do you have? Do you, sorry, do you have plans or instructions for building raised garden beds? Yes. Here's the number one instruction: If you live in the Western United States, it's probably not the best thing to do, um, especially where water is a concern. Um, if you're living in a place and you have plenty of water, I guess you can go ahead. But if you're in a city, and, you're, and you have culinary water that you're, that you're paying for, it's kind of the backwards way to do it. What you want to do is do a sunken bed because we are living in, the de in desert conditions in the Western United States, most of the Western United States. So I, I don't really teach people to do raised beds. Um, if you're in a place that has any kind of slugs or snails, that will eat a lot of your plants. If you use raised beds that have sides like wooden sides, um, those are the perfect places for um, the slugs and the snails to, to hide and to harbor. Other um, bad insects will live there also that will eat your plants. A lot of the overwintering um, animals will get in there in the cracks between the soil and those boards and they'll eat them. So I try to steer people away from raised beds. I know that they're popular. I know that people like them. I know that they're kind that people say, oh yeah, we're going to do a garden. We saw this really great thing for a raised bed. It looks so cool. It's, it'd be so cute. And, and there's all these aesthetic reasons for it, but for like, there's a lot of reasons that people are not talking about. Um, and it makes it harder to grow food actually having raised beds. Um, they, but in, back to the whole idea of the desert, um, raised beds are gonna dry out really fast. See, a lot of the gardening books that were published in the, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s, they were all published in where the big publishing houses are on the East Coast. They're not living in desert conditions. Raised beds make sense because they get a lot of rain in the springtime. And so to have a really successful garden, you wanted that soil to dry out quickly. The best way to dry that out is to have a raised bed. And so they, they popularized these ideas um, where these ideas work. And then people all across the West are doing it. And they're using three times the water than they normally would need to. So just have a flat garden, have a sunken garden. Um, in Africa, there's um, tribes of people who are pushing back the Sahara. They are growing plants on the Sahara that has just been sand by growing like two, one, one to two foot deep, um, just bowl, like bowl shape, um, just concave little holes in the ground, maybe four feet wide, 
but it, in the middle, it's a uh, it's up to two feet deep. Some of them are not that deep, but when it does rain, those will fill with the water and then they'll plant a tree right in the center and four or five other plants like a, a watermelon and other things and they thrive and do good there. A lot of people think watermelons won't grow good with very little irrigation, but they're a desert plant and they will grow very good with little irrigation. Um, okay, so that was our last question, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Share this free class with your people, whoever your friends and family are. Um, obviously, I can't answer all questions, but I can teach people how to grow food. And go to my website to see about my classes. If you can make it to any of the classes, I can absolutely help you and your family and your communities to have food. Who knows what the future is going to bring, but every week there are more dominoes that I see happening in, the, in this crazy coming apart world we have. And every week I get more convinced that more people need to be growing food. Families need to be growing food. And we need to be training new farmers how to grow food um, to feed communities. Imagine if every community of 100 people had two farmers who were working together and they were making a business to make sure that this was like a professional thing so that that community of 100 people was getting food. I'm just thinking if every 100 Americans had two full-time farmers, 100 people could support two people financially so that they had an actual real income and two people could produce enough food for those 100 people. Uh, you know, there would be no famine if that happened. Is that gonna happen? It's highly unlikely. Should it happen? Absolutely. So we need to work forward to some of these ideals and, and do the best we can to make sure that we're taking care of people. I love the scriptures where it says, to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. And, and all the other things that it says like that, you know, these are very important things. And this is the time when we need to be making sure that those things are happening so that we can take care of each other. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night. And this will be on uh, my YouTube channel probably a couple of days because tomorrow I'm busy with Bernie's graduation. And so it'll probably be two, maybe three days before this goes live, but it will be available for everybody. So um, thank you for your hard work in making the world a better place. And good night, everybody.